We've seen the role of social media in various political uprisings around the world. Could they also play a role in economic uprisings? We'll talk about that possibility next on Global Perspectives. This program is made possible in part by funding from the UCF Global Perspectives Office, the Global Connections Foundation, and the India Center at UCF. This is Global Perspectives with Pulitzer Prize winning commentator John Bercia, Special Assistant to the President for Global Perspectives at the University of Central Florida. Hello and welcome to Global Perspectives. How do you turn local turmoil into opportunity? Today's guest, Sarah Lacey, decided to find out by following the flow of capital into the developing world and looking for the best entrepreneurs who are thriving amid the chaos. Lacey spent 40 weeks traveling through the Middle East Africa, South America, China, India, and Southeast Asia. She writes about her journey in her book, Brilliant, Crazy, Cocky, How the Top 1% of Entrepreneurs Profit from Global Chaos. She is also the author of the critically acclaimed book, Once You're Lucky, Twice You're Good, and is founder and chief editor of the tech news site, pandodaily.com. Welcome to the show, Ms. Lacey. Thank you for having me here. Tell us about your 40-week project. A lot of people go abroad for a week or two or three, but that sounds incredible, almost a year of nonstop traveling. Yeah, it was. Oh, I spread it over two years um, because I, I have a husband, and he wanted to see me part of the time. Um, but it was, it was about two, three weeks of every month for two years. So it was a little bit, a little bit crazy. Um, and it was, you know, you get back, you've sort of recovered, and then you're you know, on another flight. And I mean, the other thing to remember is I was going to emerging markets. And I'm a big believer that you're not really in an emerging market unless you're in some level of pain. So I was flying coach to these places. Um, I was, you know, taking public transportation and, and pedicabs. Um, I was staying in, you know, not, not awful, awful hotel, hotels, but certainly not the lap of luxury. So um, I really experienced, um, I wanted to experience what it was like to really live um, among entrepreneurs who are starting companies in these places. So, you know, I got a like weird like skin fungus in Africa. I like, you know, had severe inner ear problems from the flight. I mean, there was definitely a lot of like wear and tear on my body from, you know, this sort of extreme travel. Um, but it was just, I mean, a, a, a life-changing experience as a reporter and a human being. Now those things you just described sound unpleasant, but you probably <laughs> also faced some harrowing situations that were potentially dangerous. I did, I did. There were about three or four times where I got a little bit scared. Um, the first was when I was traveling in Rwanda and I wanted to go over um, to um, to the DRC and see the difference between the two countries because Rwanda is, is really a safe and stabilized country now and everyone kept talking about how it was so different than its neighbors. So I convinced my driver to drive over the border with me and you know kind of sneak over and see what it was like. And we were driving along the border and first day with this driver, didn't know him very well, and all of a sudden we get stopped by some armed guards who just get in the back of the car with these like huge machetes and then we're just, and I just, I have no idea what happens and it's like there's just sort of jungle and rural roads all around us and it occurred to me, it's like I just so have put my trust in this person, I don't know. And, you know, I kind of looked at him and he kind of just gave me this look like it's okay. And we all just sat in tense silence for about 10 minutes. And then he stopped and they got out of the car and they just wanted to ride to the next oh outpost. Oh my gosh. But um, the most terrifying thing for sure um, that happened to me was also in Rwanda, my husband and I were getting some breakfast up in one of the northern parts of the country. And um, some baboons broke into uh, the restaurant and charged our table. That was probably the only time I, I just, I thought to myself, I'm either going to get rabies or lose an arm, and somehow I got out of that one. And what were you, was it your food or, or yes, your... Yes, they were addicted. It was this really great um, part of the country that has a lot of a very Serengeti-like feel, and um, some all this investment money had gone back in and tried to redevelop it for tourism purposes, but the baboons had like moved into this property in the meantime, and so they still felt like it was theirs, <laughs> and they wanted our, our bread. They were addicted to the sugar and bread. But, um, and then there was a time in Nigeria where we were um, 
uh, detained by a vigilante gang um, with machetes and had to bribe our way out. So um, another scrape in Brazil. There are a couple of interesting ones. Well, it's good that you're here and in, in one piece. <laughs> it is. I was trying to convince my husband, the guy I opened the book with who grew up in this like very, very rough slum in central Brazil, you know, very similar to City of God, if anyone's seen that movie, um, who's has a, he's built an amazing company and it's a phenomenal success story. I met him in Sao Paulo, which is where he lives now. And I really, you know, felt like I couldn't write about him unless I met his parents and saw where he grew up. And so I called him one day and I said, I want to come back to Brazil and I want you to take me to your hometown. And he was like, really? And I was like, yeah. And I said, but I need you to do me a favor. Tell me something I can tell my husband so that he's okay with this. And he thought about it for a minute and he said, well, no, no foreigners ever died in my hometown because no foreigners ever been to my hometown. <laughs> Tell us about the entrepreneurs that you've encountered in some of your favorite places, and, and how did you go about finding them? What, what, what was it that you looked for that said, ah, this, this is something I'd like to research and write about? Mm -hmm. Well, the title of the book, Brilliant, Crazy, Cocky, comes from this personality type that tends to start disruptive companies and, and tends to just see the world in a different way. I mean, people talk about great entrepreneurs being risk takers, but really they don't think of themselves as risk takers. They see very clearly a disruption that needs to happen, and it seems so obvious to them. Their mind just works differently than the rest of ours, and it's something that I've seen through you know 15 years of covering um, um, entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley and it's something that you know I don't think America has a lock on in any way and so there was all of this need to revolutionize and innovate in these countries. There was all this money flowing to them. That's where all the growth opportunities are. So I felt like there have to be those kinds of entrepreneurs there as well. And that, you know, that was sort of the hunch that started this whole crazy journey. So my sense was anyone who knew who I was, knew the publications I work for, you know, would have that I would be able to reach as an outsider was too Western focused. So anyone who's interested in talking to me, I by definition wasn't interested in talking to. And so I would go to a country with, you know, not knowing much of the language and not knowing anyone, and I would just spend two or three weeks reporting there. And it was really terrifying because my husband and I bootstrapped a lot of this journey. So putting my own money out there, you know, I, I don't know what's going to happen. And in a lot of cases, I didn't feel particularly very safe. But, I mean, sure enough, about a week in, you would just find these amazing stories, and they're everywhere out there. I mean, there's an example of this guy in Indonesia that I found who's in his 80s, who's named Mr. Chaputra. And and um, he's he uh, in, when he in his youth he decided he wanted to do an amusement park um, appropriately since we're in Orlando um, very like uh, Walt Disney World, so he wrote Walt Disney a letter. And he said, you know, I think that Jakarta is like the next great growth market. You need to do a theme park with you here. I have this plot of land from Sukarno. Let's partner on it. You know, just typical wild-eyed early 20s entrepreneur. So, of course, Walt Disney actually writes him a letter back. And um, it says, it's very short. And it says two things. It says, I'm not opening a theme park in Jakarta. And you would be advised not to use my name or likeness. <laughs> and End so this guy, Mr. Chaputra, felt like, well, well, who are you to say this can't work? I believe believe it can work. And so he built it anyway, and it's now the fourth highest grossing amusement park in the world. Mm, interesting. So entrepreneurs typically when they hear no. Yeah, I mean, it's just throwing gasoline on the fire for them. And you know, there's a lot of people telling them no now, but then there's also all these needs and all these, these problems that are being created out of these rapidly rising middle classes um, that someone needs to solve. Um, and, and the West kind of doesn't know how to solve these problems. Um, another example was a guy that I met in, in Brazil who grew up in like very rural Brazil, I think had like a, a fifth grade education at most. Um, and you know doesn't speak any English at all. Um, and he uh, he used to build um, do construction and build like pig silos and like grain silos and things like that faster than anyone else. And so one day he was um, bidding on a job that Tyson Chicken was doing in Brazil, and they wanted you know houses and dormitories in addition to you know the pig farms and all that. And um, so he said, well, what, we can absolutely do that. And like a typical entrepreneur, you know, just like we over over pitched and oversold and thought, well, let's just solve the problem once we have the deal. And so he they said, well, how are you going to build houses? You've never built houses before. Why should we give the contract to you? And he said, well, I can build them faster than anyone else. I can build a prefabbed house in 24 hours. And they were like, how is that possible? And he looked at a shoebox across the room and he thought well because I pour my molds room by room instead of wall by wall and so they were like 
okay, well, you've got the contract. He had no idea if this would work at all. And so he spent months working on the formulations and sure enough got it to work and can build houses in 24 hours. And, you know, they're pretty nice houses. I went to a village that he was building um, for the people who were building the huge multi-billion dollar hydroelectric dam project, project in central Brazil. So we went to the basement of the Amazon and it was just, you know, total jungle. And then, you know, you, you're driving, you fly for about five hours, driving a truck for several hours. And the foliage opens up to this village that looks like the opening of Edward Scissorhands. I mean, it's this suburban, you know, central Florida looking village that this man has, you know, built, uh, you know, first for pretty cheap and pretty fast. Wow. What are some of the examples? You, you talked about, uh, about several places in Asia. What are some examples of, and, and of course, Latin America and the Caribbean, um, some other examples in, um, in China and India that you might have encountered that you found fascinating? Well, um, you know, one of the ones in India, um, a lot of the interesting stuff in India is happening around um, mobile communication. That's really the only thing in infra infrastructure-wise in India that works. Uh, you know, something like two-thirds of the people don't have access to modern sanitation, don't have access to electricity, don't have access to roads. You know, it's a very fragmented country. We talk about all these Indians working in great white-collar outsourced jobs. I mean, the reality is there's, you know, about 16 million people working in the formal economy in India. Um, so it's it's a country that is very much struggling, you know, how to pull people out of villages and how to bring everyone into modernity. Um, but the one thing that does work is is mobile phones, and a couple entrepreneurs there really figured out a lot of clever ways to really compress how much they could charge people for mobile access and still make money. So in the United States, our carriers have to make about $50 a person in order for it to be profitable. Um, companies like Reliance and Airtel got that down to less than $6 a person in India because of the way they would lease and finance the equipment and um, the, the different ways that they would offer um, a lot of packages. So you have this phenomenon of the missed call in India, which is a way that basically drivers and servants and, and everyone who works for the boss can have a phone and um, they can call the boss and then the boss sees that they call and they call back because there's no charge for incoming calls but outcoming calls and the whole servant class in India and the worker class you know they all have phones which seems like a luxury to us but it's the only thing they have they don't have you know a permanent address they don't have social security they don't have anything else I mean that is their only lifeline to everything in the world so I mean, there's hundreds and hundreds of millions of phones in India and um, I met this amazing entrepreneur um, named uh, Rajiv Marotra, who's started this company called VNL, and he looked at what everyone else sees as this, you know, the one thing India's gotten right. And um, and but he saw that it, it wasn't right because there's still a lot of people in India who can't afford six dollars a month. And he thought the real opportunity was to push this deeper into villages to get that average revenue per user down below two dollars. Um, so. He totally reconstructed how base stations work. He built these very low cost sort of base station extenders that extend the mobile footprint. And they're shipped out to villages. The villagers in, like put them together themselves with like an IKEA like wrench and like very simple pictorial um, images. They're totally solar powered. They're totally maintenance free. And, um, and because the carriers don't have to spend any money on them whatsoever, they can have people paying 50 cents a dollar a month and they're still profitable customers for them. So like for the first time, people deep in these villages, um, you know, politicians are accountable to them. They get their you know, pension checks if they're qualifying for pension. They can reach, I mean, they're, they're, they're part of the country for the first time. And, you know, that's the core of innovation in India and where you see a lot of services and software companies coming on. They're all on those basic mobile phone networks, not the internet as we know it. Tell us about China. So China is fascinating. I mean, China is um, much more sophisticated with entrepreneurship than any other emerging market. Um, and it's in some ways m looks a lot more like it is in Silicon Valley. Um, you know, China is the only other country um, that has given rise to several multi-billion dollar Internet companies. Um, Tencent, uh, which is an Internet company in China, is um, the third or fourth largest in the world. Um, you know, bigger, bigger than was has been going back and forth on the stock price, but bigger than eBay. Um, you know, bigger than a lot of the giants that we that we think dominate everything. Um, they've also got Alibaba. They've also got Baidu, and they just have a raft of up and coming companies. Um, last year, about thirty percent of the companies going public on the Nasdaq were Chinese companies, and um, a lot of those are internet companies. So, really sophisticated capital, sophisticated 
entrepreneurs. Um, it's different than Silicon Valley in that it is just hyper competitive. I mean, you will have one idea and then you have hundreds and thousands of companies doing the same thing. And it's just a land grab and it moves really, really quickly and it's intense. But it's, it is, Beijing is one of the most electric places on the planet right now. Is that where you found your entrepreneurs in China or did you go out to more remote areas? I went all over. Um, I started in Beijing and Shanghai and I was not particularly blown away by Shanghai. I think it's very expat heavy. I think it's very trader heavy. I mean, you don't really have that sort of, you know, real Chinese entrepreneur there. Beijing is definitely the center of it. Um, um, but I also spent a lot of time down in Shenzhen, which is where a lot of the manufacturing happens. And um, that's actually where Tencent's based. Um, there's a lot of interesting smaller companies down there. Um, and, uh, and you know, certainly anyone wanted to do anything with hardware, um, they're doing it in Shenzhen because it's like every, you know, component and building block of, you know, our technical lives are made down there. I mean, they have this building called the SEG Electronic Marts. It's seven floors and huge, and it's like you go from, like, components and motherboards to all you get upstairs and it's like every knockoff of anything and it's just like a, a, a hacker's dream um, and then I also spent uh, I took about five seven hours of high-speed trains um, out west and just you know hit a, a for other different little towns um, I mean I think most people are making their way to Beijing but the, the country itself is just so entrepreneurial. I mean, we think of it as a capitalist country, I mean, as a communist country, and it is clearly still a very authoritarian country, but those are really two different things. There's really nothing capitalist about, I mean, sorry, communist about China right now. It's very capitalist. Um, and it's capitalist on this individual level. I mean, you look at a lot of the girls who are coming to factories. Um, in the 90s, people were doing it because their families were making them. You know, surveys of these girls have shown now that, you know, they want self-sufficiency. They want the economic opportunity. They want to get into the cities. And unlike um, places like India, where people come into the cities and just live in these slums and there's no mobility at all, factories are really a good way for uh, the rural population to get into the cities and have a place to live and, you know, have a job that we might not want to do, but it's a job nonetheless and have three meals a day. And these girls, you know, at you know, 16, 18, aggressively learn English, pick up other skills, and move out as fast as they can. I mean, it's just this this force of self-determined young women, and I think they're going to be the force of China, you know, in the next century. I, I'm curious. Uh, the Chinese are known to be the most ethnically networked mm -hmm. group uh, on the planet, and um, and this is a phenomenon that we observe worldwide. Is there a similar networking taking place among entrepreneurs in China or among entrepreneurs in general? Because it seems to me that that would be another powerful way mm -hmm. of um, exchanging ideas and, and, and advancing some of their, right. their concepts. Yeah, I think we're just beginning to scratch the surface on that. Um, I think everyone has still been very locally oriented and, you know, language barriers are a big problem to that because really the bulk of this kind of high growth entrepreneurship, you know, as we know it, is, is really headquartered in Silicon Valley. A lot of the expertise is there, the, you know, would be mentoring there, would be capitals there. And I mean, you know this as well as I do, like Americans just don't speak a lot of languages. Mm -hmm. So we're at a big disadvantage. Um, San Francisco has very few internationally direct flights. Um, so that's a big problem. And frankly, venture capitalists have had it so good for so long, they haven't really needed to leave the United States. This is the big shift though that just, that was starting to take place and this is what drove me to, to do the book. Seeing how much capital was starting to flow out of San Francisco. And it, it, is, it is so hard for Americans to go over and do business um, overseas. Um, for people to be disrupting their comfort zones that much, I thought the opportunity has to be huge. And so I think that we're now seeing people leave, which is great, but I think there's still way more that needs to be done to build these cross-country uh, connections between entrepreneurs. Um, we, when I was at uh, TechCrunch, my former job, we put together a conference that we did in China, and um, we it was a branch of our, our popular conference we did called Disrupt, and we focused it just, you know, rather than trying to just fly in a bunch of Silicon Valley people and tell them how to start companies or whether or rather than trying to be the definitive tech conference in Beijing we focus squarely on that intersection between Silicon Valley and China where it goes wrong where it goes right challenges with it and you know thousands of people attended I mean I think there's so much demand for 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 how do we interface on those bridges between because you know to me this is the business story of the next century mm -hmm.
I think it's fascinating because so many people seem to have this notion that English is the language of commerce, English is the language of the internet, we don't really need to learn these other languages and cultures, and the opposite is true. Yeah. And, and you know, you're somebody from a tech background and you're advocating the importance of foreign language training. Yeah. And, and this, there's a disconnect there with a lot of people. Yeah, you know, I grew up, my parents were both teachers and I had a great education, but the only regret I have is I didn't learn more languages at a young age because, you know, it, anyone growing up today who speaks multiple languages in America has just has so many advantages. Um, because increasingly it's not our world. I mean, uh, the United States is the only current G7 nation that will still be one of the seven largest economies um, in the next 40 years. I mean, that's staggering to think about. China will be roughly double our size. India will be about our size. And people love to say Indians speak English. Not true. Go spend time over there. A very small percentage of them do. It's going to be very hard for America to be humble enough to play the role that it's going to be cast into in this world, but also have the actual tools to do it. So where would you start with foreign language training? How early? I mean, I'm putting my child in a Chinese immersion preschool. So That's early. <laughs> early. Um, we also live in the Mission District in San Francisco, which is the most ethnically diverse district. So we want him to learn at a minimum Spanish and Chinese. And fortunately, he, our neighborhood can be a real life uh, language lab. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so what's the next project for you? Well, the next project is my company I just started, which is Pando Daily. Um, I had been an editor for a blog called TechCrunch. Um, we were acquired by AOL. And I think anyone who has uh, worked for a company that's gone, gotten acquired knows those things usually don't go very well. So <laughs> there was a bit of an explosion and an exodus of ta talent last fall. Um, and so I decided to, to start again. Um, I was very disappointed when we sold. I thought TechCrunch was starting to scratch the surface. Um, you know, we had about 10, 15 million uniques, and it was this powerful blog that entrepreneurs all over the world really connected with and wanted to read. Um, we also now have about six years of learning of the blogosphere and learned a lot of things about what we do differently next time. So um, I raised about two and a half million dollars and have been building this thing, and we're about three months in. Now, do you see all of these connections that are being made through technology as a way of bringing the world together and, and making people feel closer? Mm -hmm. of, or, because a lot of people see it as creating obstacles. Oh, I think it absolutely brings the world closer. I think there's so much fear about technology, and people always say, well, those aren't real relationships or whatever. But it's like, I, I think a lot of that's ridiculous. I, I think when technology gets in the middle of, say, my relationship with my husband, and I only interface with him on Facebook, yes, that would be a degradation of relationship. But when I go to China once, and you know, I, I'm naturally gonna lose touch with everyone I met there. But now, in an age of Facebook, Twitter, everything else, I don't lose the connection, I don't lose the threads that I started pulling between all these places. So I think it's a huge connector. But I think there's no substitute for face-to-face -face interaction. I mean, people just need to get on planes. And uh, to wrap up, do you have a favorite entrepreneur in all these travels, all these countries? Was there one person and one project that just every time you looked at it and talked about it just made you smile? Yeah, well, smile or cry. I mean, a lot of the stories are really touching. Um, you know, one of the ones um, that's it's hard it's hard to outdo is an entrepreneur named Jean de Gio Kagabo, who I met in Rwanda. Um, and his parents were, his parents and most of his family was killed in the Rwandan genocide. And um, he was about 15 years old. He had two younger sisters and two older brothers. And he had he'd come from a fairly rich family. They owned a bunch of petrol stations. Um, and his two older brothers were just, like a lot of people in Rwanda, really stuck in post-traumatic stress and um, were alcoholics and were sort of wrecking the whole family fortune. And uh, Jean de Dieu was about 18 when he realized what was going on and he had this family to take care of. And they only had about $12,000 left. And he looked around him and he saw that, you know, Rwanda needed people to manufacture things locally. It's a very landlocked place. Bringing things in is very expensive and it's a very poor country. And all the local manufacturing was really decimated in that genocide. So he decided to start with something very humble that everyone needs. And he thought toilet paper. And so he, with his last $12,000, he taught himself Mandarin, flew to China, bought manufacturing equipment, brought it back, and has started what's become a huge consumer packaged good empire within the country today. See, I was thinking you were going to say something that was high-tech oriented, <laughs> and then well, it's toilet paper. It, it's but, toilet but, paper, but, but his thinking is very high-tech. I mean, it's like it's less about sheer technology, and it's more about 
innovative thinking. If you think about it, something like Twitter isn't particularly that high tech. You know, you're, it's basically based on SMS, which is a pretty crude form of technology. It's that kind of thinking that's emanated from Silicon Valley that was I found so inspiring. Great. Well, thank you, and thank you for joining us today, Ms. Lacey. My pleasure. And thank you. For Global Perspectives, I'm John Bercia, and we'll see you next time. This program is made possible in part by funding from the UCF Global Perspectives Office, the Global Connections Foundation, and the India Center at UCF.